This is API Case Files. Hear this message. Tune this channel. Like E.T. said. Hello, welcome to API Case Files. I'm Marsha Barnhart, API Chief of Investigations, and your host for this fall 2015 episode. Later in the program, you'll hear also from Antonio Paris, the Director of the Aerial Phenomenon Investigations Team, and API Deputy Director Paul Carr. This is API Case Files. In this episode 8, I'll examine an intriguing case out of North Carolina. The more I look, the stranger this thing started to move around. Paul, Antonio, and I talk about ways to improve the state of UFO research and reporting. And we play an excerpt of Paul's recent interview with podcast UFO host, Martin Willis. The reason science has not really been interested in this topic is that it's not an easily solvable problem. This is API Case Files. Over the years, I have noticed a fair amount of sightings coming out of the Carolinas. Often, these sightings seem to be situated nearby known military installations. As to whether these sightings are related to U.S. military-industrial complex experiments or research, well, that is an unknown. The proximity may be merely coincidental. Or not. It's all pure speculation. There is really no way to prove or disprove this aspect of the issue. Nonetheless, I recently closed an intriguing case out of Winston-Salem, North Carolina. This was a two-witness sighting at night of a small airplane-sized bright bluish-white object that passed directly overhead and in front of the couple while driving a busy highway. Case 15041 was eventually closed as unidentified, but it did have a lasting impression on the couple. The witness had a hard time letting go of what they had seen and was hoping for some answers. It's something that, I don't know, we think about a lot. So I hope it's exciting to actually get somebody to call back and actually investigate. This case came to API's attention in August of 2015. But the experience took place December 2014. It was 5 p.m. Saturday, December 13th. Witness 1 was driving with his girlfriend to a quality mart located at 3180 Peters Creek Parkway, Winston-Salem. While driving on Ardmore Street, west, towards the Quality Mart, Witness 1 noticed a brightly lit orb-like object passing directly above the windshield of his F-150 pickup. His first thought was that the object might be a remote-controlled drone or amateur quadcopter. However, once he realized the distance the light had traveled during his entire encounter, he dismissed that as less probable. He did note that the object appeared to be changing colors randomly from white to electric blue-violet. I just happened to look up and I saw what looked like a, like a blue-white. I'm not really sure which one because it was through the, the UV tint part of my windshield, a little blue stripe at the top. So as I got to look in, uh, I was like, that's not normal because I don't know anything that's a circle that can fly like that. The object did not exhibit typical strobe-like aircraft lighting. And once the witness reached the Quality Mart, he began to film the object on his phone camera as it moved away from his location. That video was posted to YouTube, and I've included the link in the show notes. During my telephonic interview with Witness 1, the witness estimated that from his location at the Quality Mart, the distance of the object was around a mile and a half to three miles away. The object size was estimated at around 10 to 15 feet in diameter. 
However, Witness 1 stressed he could not be sure of the size or the distance, since there was no discernible distance markers and it was nighttime. During my interview with Witness 2, she related essentially the same details. Witness 2 felt the object was about the size of a car or small bus because it initially flew right over their pickup and she thought at first it was a plane due to its size and light emission. He just happened to look up and see something odd and I just looked up and I really didn't pay much attention to it. And I was like, it's an airplane. It kept going and the more I looked, the stranger this thing started to move around and everything else. Then it started like glowing and it was blue looking sort of. And we kept following it a little bit on the way to get something to eat. And then I was like, let's pull over at the store and let's, you know, get out. And that's when he started recording. After observing the object, it became clear it wasn't a plane or a helicopter. And it would go from like a uh, like a light blue to sort of like a purple color, and it seemed to like change like how high up it was, and then it would go down low and it would go up high. It was just all over the place, really, and I've never seen anything like it, really. If you were up to it, how big do you suppose it would be? If I was up to it, I want to say it's probably about the size of like a, a truck or maybe a car. That's what I'm guessing. I was wondering if the object made any sound that you could discern. No, no sound at all. It was quiet. Did you see any protrusions or, or any um, uh, windows or knobs sticking off it or anything? No, it was just, it was just a color, like an a orb, sort of. Witness 2 felt the object blinked out a couple of times, and the video footage appears to confirm this in several spots. Witness 1 estimated the object was in the area over the Walmart Supercenter, down the road about a mile and a half south of the location in which they were filming. Uh, given that it was just a light orb, you know, and I don't know how big it was originally, it's kind of hard for me to give a frame of reference, but as I was coming down Ardmore, I was much closer because the object was a lot bigger. Um, well, it had pretty good altitude on it, about where a helicopter would fly, it looked like to me in the video, and then it dropped down quite a bit and seemed to be right along a tree line at some point. Yeah, it wasn't exceptional, like, UFO speed or anything, but it was, it was odd. If you look at the posted video, you can clearly see it is not traveling like the ISS or any known satellite or as sky lanterns normally do. I checked the appropriate satellite sites to see if anything fit but found nothing. It could have been an amateur drone. What I found most intriguing was the object's method of meandering flight. Because during my investigation, I found another video posted from a MUFON investigation of a very similar object traveling in almost exactly the same curious pattern, rather like the object was searching an area for something. Take a look at both the posted videos and compare them yourself. There is no way, really, to identify what these objects are, and my investigation into 15041 provided no definitive answers. But the search for answers remains a worthwhile endeavor. This final note, please do make the time to report any sightings you may have. After, of course, due diligence of eliminating obvious explanations, such as sightings of Venus when it's brightly present, or the scheduled and posted flyovers of the International Space Station, and you can check when the ISS is due over your area and other known satellite flybys at various websites. In addition, you can easily check if a quick bright flash in your night sky was a meteor by going to the American Meteorological Society's websites. These websites are in the show notes of this program. Copy and paste them into your favorites and it will provide a handy reference for any of you who might be interested in UFO investigation. At any rate, do fill out our API report form, or the National UFO Reporting Center's form, or MUFON's form. The links to these sites are also provided in our show notes.
This is API Case Files. Podcast UFO host Martin Willis created his show in 2011 and has since had a multitude of guests discussing that topic with him. He created the podcast to provide a place where anyone who had experience or insight on the subject could interact and be heard. Paul Carr recently interviewed Martin Willis for our new podcast offering, API Conversations. We will provide the link on our show notes to that site so you can download the conversation. When Paul Carr asked why Martin Willis began his interest in UFOs, Mr. Willis had this to say. I always was kind of open-minded to the UFO topic. Growing up, uh, there was actually a wave, a flap in uh, New England during the 60s. So I grew up while that was happening. Um, I had a sighting back in 2006 that I still can't explain today. Um, I don't think it was anything that possibly could have been made on Earth. And... um, when people ask me what made it exceptional to me at the time was that something was moving above me. Um, it was a form that I could see clearly and that it absolutely made no sound at all. And that's what was the most baffling to me is the fact that it didn't make any sound. Well, you know, a lot of people, uh, have reported experiences where they see something and they can't get the attention of other people. Hmm. Uh, that's not universally been the case, but it's almost like, they can't see it. Wow. And uh, you know, I don't know what that's about, but uh, we do see things like that, including one of my own, uh, I would, I'm not going to say it a UFOs, but something I saw flying uh, low in the sky. And uh, there were other people within earshot of me. And I said, what's that? And nobody even looked. Oh. <laughs> it's a, they just ignored me. And, and uh, I have a pretty loud voice. And <laughs> I said, what's that? And I pointed to it. And I ran over to where I could get a better look, and nobody came with me. Nobody looked, and uh, and of course, uh, my cell phone was in the in the house, <laughs> and I I didn't get a chance to get an image of it. But you know, that's the thing. Also, you talk about images, people snapping pictures, whatever. When I had my sighting, it was the last thing from my mind. Um, I didn't have a phone anyway out there, uh, but regardless, I never even. It never even crossed my mind. I was just glued to it. I was fascinated by it. And uh, a picture now, of course, I think I would totally react differently. But at that time, and I think a lot of people are feeling the same way. Like, you know, a picture is like, wow, I never even thought of it. Yeah. I hear that from witnesses sometimes. Or they say, by the time I got my phone out, (laughs) it was gone. Or they say, yeah, I tried to get a picture, but this is all I got, which is a fuzzy little blob uh, of light, you know, and not very helpful. Uh, well, well, I, there was a, I was in Boston uh, in a park oh, a few weeks ago, and there was a blimp flying over, and I thought as a joke I would, you know, send a friend or something, oh, look at the UFO. I couldn't even get my camera ready by the time, and you know how slow blimps go? Yeah. It was just, you know, went through the trees and, you know, above me, and that was, <laughs> I couldn't even get it together. Hmm. <laughs> Now, when you started your podcast uh, on the UFO topic, um, did you have much sense of direction at that point, or did you say, well, I'm just going to start interviewing people and see what happens? Or, Well, luckily, I had been doing a couple of different podcasts. Um, one was on comedy and comedians, and that's no longer available. And then another one on my background, which is, uh, is antiques, fine art. I've been um, in that field for 40-something years since I was a little kid, and... Uh, So I had already been doing a lot of podcasts and knew how to go about contacting people. But I found um, my very first podcast, which is always a hard show to to get someone on. You know, I mean, I decided I was going to do a UFO podcast. And that's why I chose kind of a silly name for it, Podcast UFO. But it sure gets a lot of hits. Anyone looking for a uh, podcast on UFOs will definitely land on my page. So anyway... um, I contacted a number of people, including Stanton Friedman and, you know, a lot of people in the field. I had no idea what I was doing, basically, when it 
came to UFOs. I just had a curiosity and my own sighting. I started watching YouTube videos and started reading. Um, this is all in 2000, uh, toward 2011 when I finally started the show. Uh, the sighting happened in 2006. So uh, finally, I was Stephen Bassett, you know, dis Mr. Disclosure. Uh, um, he answered, sure, I'll be on your, sh your first show, no problem at all. So um, I've had him on a few times, you know, because of that, I'm grateful that he was the first one to take a chance. I don't totally agree with everything Stephen says, but uh, that's not up to me. I, I present you know, a lot of guests and let the uh, listening audience decide uh, for themselves about that guest. I won't uh, say it here, but I, on my unidentified science, I tried to talk about uh, you know, some of the things I think reasons scientists won't come near the topic, uh, why, why it would be a career limiting move for them to do so. Uh, and it's really not entirely their fault, but, but uh, mm -hmm. some, some of it's historical. And some of it is mm -hmm. is toxicity in the in the field. Um, the reason science has not really been interested in this topic is that it's not an easily solvable problem. Yeah. So the way to get scientific credibility back is to try to. I mean, you're not going to get repeat observations very often, and if you do, that probably means it's a natural phenomenon. That could be an assumption. Um, yeah. You know, but there's. So many um, people that talk about these, you know, repeat sightings like the Belgium Triangle, you know, that was in an area. The thing that, you know, doesn't make any sense. And oftentimes I just wonder that we may be completely wrong just in our wondering what a UFO is, is that um, why would if something did travel, say, 100 light years or five light years or whatever to get here? Uh, why would it stick around in one little area? Because um, a lot of times people will see the same UFO um, for days on end and sometimes even longer, you know, repeatedly. So things don't seem to make any sense like that. But, uh, you know, the whole thing is just totally baffling anyway. Well, it might be for our benefit. Uh, but, of course, we don't really... Trying to figure out the, what would motivate a very advanced technical civilization is probably hopeless yeah uh, right mm -hmm. and, or why they would do anything uh just like trying to make faces out of things we're trying to um we're trying to use uh, what we would do uh you know and what you know we always compare our thoughts or our our, our reactions or even our evolution to what um, they may be yeah and we really don't have anything else to work with right i mean <laughs> so you, basically you have to be wrong and uh, then you compare your wrong idea to observations and and try to fix it. Uh, you're you're not you're not going to be able to form a, a really good hypothesis about anything, which is what's called normal science, right? Uh, that that's not available on on this in this field. We're kind of where the Renaissance scientists were. We're trying to figure out what lightning was, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there's still. There's still a lot of things that are really hard for even no matter how much, uh, you know, they're looked into, you know, quantum mechanics, uh, entanglement. Um, uh, there's, uh, you know, dark matter, dark energy. These are all things that are, you know, not really 100 percent in any type of way, but, you know, just uh, observed and, you know, that um, hardly makes sense. Right. Of course, we wouldn't even know about those things if we hadn't undertaken rigorous science. Dark energy is not something that we found out through divine revelation. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was something that came uh, from a lot of very careful astronomical observations. So, and yeah, we don't know what it is, but uh, I think it's cool. There's stuff we still don't have to figure it out. <laughs> but, Me too. Uh, I'm all for it. Uh, and when we figure that out, it's probably something else that, that we won't understand. So, uh, well, I think um, I always think of it this way is, you know, it's just, the more you look into things, the more, you know, you see that there's more questions. Right.
That's podcast UFO host Martin Willis, the guest on API Conversations with API's Deputy Director, Paul Carr. By the way, the link to this recording is on our show notes. Antonio, Paul, and I recently got together on Google Plus to discuss, among other things, our thoughts about the state of research and reporting in ufology currently. We threw around some ideas on how to go about collating usable, legitimate data. But we also lamented the fact that some hoax and perpetrate fraud, especially on the internet, to realize financial gain. You can make millions of dollars a year putting up bogus UFO videos on, on YouTube. Millions? Hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars, yeah. It, it, you just have to draw enough eyeballs and you get the advertising revenue. Wow. Uh, I think Third Phase of the Moon, yeah. you heard of them, right? They yeah. They post a lot of hoax UFO videos. Oh, yeah. They, they make a good living. Two brothers that do that. Wow. And they have no shame. Mm. They'll post any piece yeah. of junk up there. But they've posted some pretty compelling stuff, too. I don't know if all their stuff is hoax crapola. Uh, I don't think anything, any of it's ever panned out. Uh, you get, you get, as soon as it gets up there, there's people who are very good at identifying CGI all over it, and they'll tell you exactly what's wrong with it. Yeah. Uh, oh. The recent one in, that was shot, like these orbs in Japan, they were all over it. And they said, yep, yeah, hoax. Yeah. There's a special there's a special level of hell for people who hoax UFO stuff. If there isn't, there should be because it's really causing problems. That's in any is that that's not just UFOs. That's anything. Yeah, I agree. And and yeah, but, well, all I'm caring about that right now is hoax UFOs. Yeah. Well, drives yeah. me nuts. Let, let's not get started on the uh, on the the mummy. <laughs> well, let's not go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> no. In the end, you can really prove nothing. We're just throwing this out here. But, you know, what my wish would be, I don't know that, we, I know we don't have the resources to do it, but it would be great if somebody could start making sense of all the bits and pieces and collate it into a coherent picture. This would be a Herculean task to try to get out all the hoax and the crapola and try to narrow things down winnow it down to real good data and try to make sense of patterns and and things like that it would be there, so nice if we could get really, something like that that's a monumental not only a monumental task there's re, like like uh paul just said there's probably a hundred million times the amount of non-reported data than there is reported data and then you got to weed out my god all the hoaxes all the crap all the BS conspiracies or deathbed confessions and there's if you guys ever get a chance and join actual MUFON so you get access at least from your from your state the amount the types of cases that are reported on a daily basis you will quickly come to realize there's not much data there really isn't you know sure they get 10,000 reports a year but like I said before you look at those 10,000 reports there's only maybe a 30 there or something to actually look at. So, yeah. well, I, and then, and then the pat, there's really no pattern. There's not like I can, I can say, oh my God, there's 65 black triangle cases in this area alone in the last 30 years. That's the pattern. But I don't, I didn't see that. I, you know, I tried to do that. You know, there's no pattern that there are more abductions in. Wichita, Kansas, in 1982, as opposed to anywhere else, we I don't see those patterns. It's just Wait, so the, the it's last random time, noise yeah. everywhere. The last time somebody tried to do that was probably Jacques Vallée in the 60s, uh, and also uh, NICAP, uh, Dick Hall at NICAP. Uh, yeah. Now he Dick Hall didn't have access to a computer. Uh, Vallée was a computer scientist, so uh, he was able to actually 
compile a database. But what Dick Hall did was take this enormous volume of cases that NICAP had, many of which they'd investigated themselves, and compiled them into, into a volume called The UFO Evidence. And he did try to sort things out by shape, by who saw what, by lots of other variables. Uh, it, it's a good attempt at looking for patterns. It's not, you know, it was not the last word, but this is a thick volume. Uh, and that there's two, actually two thick volume, uh, volume one and volume two of the UFO evidence. Paul was a very assiduous researcher. He didn't, he didn't have access to modern techniques, but he had, uh, he had a lot of energy and it's there. You can look it up. You can, for example, he has every, you know, he'll have, uh, he'll have sightings by police officers, sightings by pilots, that sort of thing. Uh, what are the pattern? If there is a pattern, it's probably more subtle than anything we've looked for. And I think we also have to recognize that what we primarily have to work with is not hard evidence, but people's memories. And we really ought to be, we ought to be treating the data as that, as, as a record of some, what someone remembers. But I think we've all developed a pretty good BS filter over the last two or three years. We, we can look at a report and immediately tell this guy is on the up and up or not. And I mean, have, have you, haven't you noticed that, that you can kind of tell just by talking to somebody or reading the report that they're maybe not a perfect witness, but they might, but they're sincere. Yeah. Not that many, but gentlemen, let me interject this. Uh, well, for one, I am a member of Muf MUFON, longtime member, and I'm a member of Michigan MUFON, and I attend their meetings since I moved up here. And um, but there are, if if one were to do this case, if one were to do this study, it would have to be investigated cases only. It can't be, you know, like taking stuff off a uh, national UFO reporting network. It'd have to be investigated cases. Now, yes. there are good cases. There is good data. And for example, NAR Capalone and Richard Haynes, they've got a bunch of, of credentialed scientists and engineers who have actually done very, very good uh, reports on this, scientific reports. Now, there is evidence, gentlemen, and it's in the form of anomalous, often in the form of anomalous um, radar data. And so there is evidence, but if one wants to cherry pick, then you could say, well, there is no real good data. There is good data. And it is either being ignored or yeah, but the you, willful you, you ignorant have, you have are not careful. interested in it. You have to be careful with radar well, of data. Of course you do. There's a, it, anonymous radar data it could be a million things, including a flock of birds, you know. Yeah. So, I know, unless the, people unless who run radar and who are experts on it. Unless the they know if it's a flock of birds, Antonio. The and they know when something is a paintable object. No, I don't subscribe to the theory that there is no good data. That, no, there's there's no good data that, okay, just because there's a couple of handful of scientists that say some, that this is pretty cool stuff, you, that doesn't mean that it's a, it, it's not, for me, good physical evidence is something that's concrete. That's it. The entire academic scientific community accept that, and it, and it's published published through peer review and committees. Not a couple of scientists working for MUFA and, and that are retired, you know, stuff like that. I'm not saying that the good data that the scientists are looking at on you know these anomalous radars is not good data. What I'm saying it, it, it could be good data. They could be good scientists, but Nothing's being published. Something, you know, writing a report and it's on some conspiracy website on MUFON for a couple of days doesn't mean that it's it's it's, no, no, it's no. legitimate evidence. NARCAP, yeah. NARCAP is not conspiracy, and it's not maybe a good scientist. Richard Haynes I is know. a top-notch brain, and he and his ilk are involved in the NARCAP type things. That isn't conspiracy nutcase woo-woo stuff. Nobody... This is nailed down science. But nobody takes, and they are publishing it. I know, but no one takes it. Well, that's that's the, what I'm saying. Because it, there are people sitting back saying, unless I see a chunk of metal in my hand that I can say came from Venus, I won't believe it. But I, I categorically deny that there is no good science and there is no good data. If you don't want to believe it, you don't have to. 
that's up to you. Well, what about the Stephenville case? Uh, for example, uh, some, some fellows at MUFON, you have to be fast with this because the, the data, the radar tapes get erased, but they move quickly. They got the radar tapes. They were able to, uh, get access to a machine that could read them. And they were able to show that there were objects, uh, with very strong returns in the area. Plus they could see all the transponders that, uh, you know, aircraft all have to carry transponders. So, uh, when you get a, you get a radar reflection from, from, uh, even a small, uh, private plane, it will identify that aircraft, uh, military aircraft as well. So, they, you know, you can see what are known aircraft and you can see a return. Now, does that mean it couldn't be a plasma wave or something like that? Not, not without some analysis. You have to look at it carefully. But the, the, the fun, because there's been an enormous amount of money put into radar, there's a very good understanding of the phenomenology of various things that are seen on radar, uh, particularly by the military. So they have a strongly vested interest in not misidentifying. So, and, but but if you look, if you ask for say NORAD tapes, you won't get them. NORAD does not take FOIA requests, so it's it's almost impossible to get get any uh, data from the space fence or from uh, from any of the space radars that. And 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 you have to tell, I have to point out, they see stuff all the time. They don't know what it is, but that shouldn't surprise anybody, and it's not necessarily anomalous because there's a lot of stuff up there that. Just drifts around in the, and they lose track of it. But occasionally NORAD will see something that's moving really fast. But it could be a plasma wave. It could be some other some other kind of uh, phenomenon in the, in the upper atmosphere. So you would have to be a really highly qualified scientist to take those in, those data and do anything meaningful with them. Should that be done? Yes, I think so. Most of that radar stuff is not upper atmosphere, though, Paul. Radar. Most well, radar I'm, is, I'm talking about the, the, Nor, is, the NORAD. The, the NORAD uh, yeah, stuff. NORAD aside. NORAD's not really interested in anything <laughs> below, you know, below uh, uh, 100,000 feet. Uh, yeah, so NORAD would not be any place you're going to get information because they're that's their duty. So NORAD is well, they is don't, an they empty don't hide to keep in mind. hiding. But, you got to be careful now. Hiding something and protecting it is, is two different things. Yeah. Just because they see something and they don't. Re- they don't need to report it. Doesn't mean they're hiding. Well, NORAD will. Well, they wouldn't report it. They no, wouldn't. NORAD do report. They, they, they do report, report the uh, orbit elements of unclassified satellites. And if you go on to uh, any of these sites, the satellite tracking sites, a lot of the data they have there about the location of the satellites is from NORAD. And I've yeah. called, I've called NORAD on the phone many times as part of my job and said, "Can you tell me?" what the orbit elements of my satellite are. This is, you know, open, open line, not, not, you know, not a classified yeah. uh-huh. uh, communication at all. And they'll, they'll say, yeah, just give me a minute here. And they'll come back and they'll read, read the orbit elements over the phone to me. And they'll even tell me how many observations they have on it. Uh, so, you know, there, there's a lot that's open. Uh, there's a lot that's not. Uh, if they detect something that they know is something they're not supposed to talk about, uh, you won't get anything out of them, and they won't take freedom of information requests because they are a joint U.S. Canadian uh, operation. So that you know, you'd have to I, do some kind of magic by filing both the Canadian and the U.S. requests simultaneously. And <laughs> I, I don't think there's a lawyer who figure that out, Marsha. If you're right, it, it's, it has to do with resources, the money. You have to have somebody who really takes this as a, their professional job, or somebody retired who has plenty of time sort through these patterns. And I, I think that there's encouraging signs that people understand that now, that no one case is going to give us the, is going to be a smoking gun. And the thing to do is look for patterns. And those, and when then you find those patterns, the thing to do is then ask more questions about what else is out there, the patterns. Uh, are we going to find an obvious pattern? I don't think so. It'll be a subtle pattern at best. You know, I, I think people, going back to the 60s, people have been looking for those. And, uh, it, 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 and you're right. It it very much depends yeah. on what data you accept. If you just grab the New Fork database, you're going to get so much noise. You're not going to have any kind of hope of finding anything. Yeah, you can go back. Yeah, that just decades. would not be valid input. That is not valid. You need you, 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 you good going back decades. Cases. That's the only thing you could use, because that way you're going to knock out 
kooks, you're going to knock out the obvious. It was Venus, and whether or not people want to believe it or not, folks are still misidentifying Venus. So you oh, have yeah. to knock out the obvious. You would be left with what you would consider were were good, solid cases that had been investigated. Then collate that information and try to make some sense of it. But a human couldn't do it. You'd probably have to toss it in some kind of you know, computer database that would spew out something. I don't know, but guys, just but it would be a Herculean task. Just just a couple of weeks ago, I I had at least 17 phone calls at the museum asking me what are those two bright objects towards the sunset, and obviously that was the Jupiter and Venus conjunction. Right. So people are still seeing things and they have no clue what it is. <laughs> And and you can go into uh, I went into the MUFON database for Florida and people were reporting that they they, they calling them two yeah. bright UFOs you know one called one the mothership because it was bigger and brighter which was Venus and that's the stuff that's gonna haunt us forever guys it's yeah. not because they're idiots it's not because they're dumb it's not because they they it's just they don't know what they're looking at you know for some of us like the three of us who have been doing this now for a couple of years. It begun, it, you know, we think we got the smoking gun, but we just by reading, and I, I can see your emails already, Marsha, that you're already quickly weeding out cases just based on the reports that we're getting, you know, and I can see you already using your, your judgment that you've learned in the last couple of years. Well, that's not a UFO. That's something easily explained. But people don't know that. People are still, rep people will still be reporting Venus for the next hundred years. Well, that, that the raw report, as we said, the raw reports are not good enough we have to move past the raw reports and, and that you can only really deal with the investigated reports and competently investigated reports that's yeah. a subset of the of the investigated reports and uh you know because some of these investigators go with an agenda they they want to believe it was some kind of alien spacecraft and they're not willing to, to look for the mundane explanation that's perhaps right in front of their face you know, yeah. and people will get very excited when they see a star twinkling on the horizon, thinking that it's yeah, uh, that is some kind of uh, ship from the Pleiades. And yeah, yeah. And guys, <laughs> if if I was to, if you look at, if you look on our website, and if I was to remove those five criterias as priorities, I yeah. I guarantee you, we, oh lordy, we would be inundated with reports every day. I guarantee you there's people going on my website yeah. to report a UFO and saying, uh, yeah, I don't meet those five. I just saw something during the daytime. They wouldn't, they, they'll go to MUFON or somewhere else because that's what MUFON does. I, I think, I think we're going to keep the website the way it is because we, that's, that's what we want. Notice the, the reporting has lowered, but you know, for the last four or five years, we averaged 70, 80, 90 cases a year. As soon as we put up these five criterias, and this was only a year ago, we put up these new criterias. I, I you see the cases have reduced. Yes. I don't think yeah. I don't think people are seeing less. I don't think people are ignoring us. I think people are now the same amount of people are going to our website and saying, "Uh, yeah, I don't meet those five criteria. I'm not. I'm not going to." And and that's kind of a good thing for us because the cases we're getting, at least most of them. Are meeting three or four of those criteria now i can remove those criteria and we'll go back to 90 100 cases a year that's easily but that's just noise yeah so i think that we all should be out there trying to educate the community about all these things you know for example when uh venus is prominent in the sky or there's a, you know there's a there's a uh, optical conjunction between two bright planets we should go on to your favorite ufo forum and say hey folks this is going to happen next week and it's going to be really bright and really pretty and uh, watch out for all kinds of UFO reports and that kind of thing. I think it'll take you 10 seconds in it and it, it helps to sort of prepare the ground a little bit, you know, but people are still looking at shooting all these videos of Chinese lanterns. Uh, so and, and Paul and Paul, and you have to be careful because I've gotten three or four of these cases already. People post stuff on YouTube just for the, they just want the clicks, you know, like that girl in, uh, in that, the Arizona case that I was doing recently, uh, we know it was, it was a bogus case, and she was looking for her YouTube viewership to increase. And basically, I, I put her on the spot on that, and she disappeared off radar. She's no longer, you know, interested in the in the case. So, old-fashioned uh, detective work, guys. That's what it goes back down to, you know, phone calls, 
uh, looking at the evidence, visiting the site if possible. You go where the evidence is and be careful what's out there on the internet. You know, stick to the meetings. You know, I'm I'm I recently started going back to the MUFON meetings here locally just to see what's going on. I have a mini UFO uh, meeting. I don't like to say conference uh, to you know get the MUFON community here you know together stuff like that. So. I think we're doing good work, you know. I, I we're getting cases. I like the my last my, my current case is is pretty good. Uh, so who knows? It's it's random, and one day maybe we might get that good case. You know, we don't know. So well, I was just going to say that um, I I don't mean to sound negative. I would say it's more just uh, practical that I don't know how we're going to ever prove this. Because, um, Marcia, yeah. I, I had a big face talk last night with like 300 people showed up, and the, and the topic was, uh, you know, search for life in the universe, this whole new Russian tycoon spending 100 million dollars, and it's it's almost the same thing. We will never know if there's life in the universe if no one does it. You know, if SETI doesn't do it, if if Stephen Hawking's new venture program doesn't do it. Um, if someone doesn't do it, we will never know. It's the same thing with UFOs. We will never get to the bottom of this unless there's organizations investigating. There might be no one out there. We might be alone in the universe. And I, I ended up my conference saying that the lack of evidence it, it keeps it allows us to wander and speculate all we want. You know, so there's a million people that think there's life in the universe. There's a million people who say there's no life. We're, we're alone. And until there's evidence to to tell us one way or another, we can have fun as much as we want, you know. And that's the same thing with UFOs. You know, my personal take is I don't see any evidence aliens exist. I don't see any evidence they don't exist. So we're going to have as much fun as possible and continue these investigations. Well, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that we even know what we're talking about when we say aliens exist or don't exist. I mean, I'm. We don't know what aliens are, right? I, yeah. <laughs> so uh, we have nothing, have no understanding of their uh, their nature or why why they would come visit Earth if they if they are, uh, and what what their technology would be, and what how how it would manifest themselves. Um, That's like totally beyond the scope of API. Yeah. Unless unless we finally get evidence, and this is it. We we it's we found it. it the Smithsonian paid us $3 million so they can put that UFO up. Uh, then we get into those discussions. Why are they visiting us? Why? What, what is this technology? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, the why questions are, 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 they're very popular, but they're impossible to answer. And people love to speculate. Yeah, all we can do in our organization is just stick to the facts, report what we know. And the whole, my opinion personally, is that this is a subject that is so beyond the, Homo sapien kin that we cannot, we're not going to be able to grasp it. We perhaps we don't have the faculties to yeah. grasp the whole thing. You know, I'm in the valet, the valet kind of area that this may not be nuts and bolts at all, people. This may be something that is so beyond our understanding that we're like anthropomorphizing God and having him as a man who sits on a throne because we can't figure any other way to go at it. The same with this, what we call the UFO phenomenon. I just don't think we're equipped to answer it or prove it. Well, I, I, I'm optimistic, Marcia, because I think we have a history of wrapping our tiny little brains around some pretty difficult things over, over time. It may take generations, but, uh, you know, we've made tremendous progress. And, you know, we know a lot about things that we can't see or touch now. And we really do know a lot. I mean, it's not, it's not delusional. So I think that, yeah, you're right. Probably it's quite, quite possible that right now we don't have the conceptual toolkit to follow what's going on. It doesn't mean that we can't start slowly getting there, but it's going to take time and it's going to take, uh, what we really have to do is win back scientific respectability for the topic. And then it's not going to happen when you got all these, like you just said, all these stupid websites and people doing hoaxes and, and the media spinning everything, you know, it's 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 a difficult challenge. What I'm hoping will happen is that all the public interest will eventually wane, and and the old ufologists will retire or die, and then there will be a period of quiet. Well, there'll be just quiet 
research going on for a while and then we can we can slowly start filling that that gap with with real information uh but there have always been good people in the field who've done good yeah. work uh, i i i want to i want to show marcia a slide that i showed last night during my talk yeah i, I emphasize that and I, this is my personal opinion seti and the billionaires all trying to look for life in the universe is the analogy i use is First of all, what are we listening for? How do we listen for it? How do we know it's there? And I said, it's like me giving a pair of headphones to my dog and telling my dog, I need you to go listen for worms in China. And, and that's basically what we're doing. The, the dog, the dog, you know, has no clue what's going on. He has no clue what he's listening to. He doesn't know what the heck a worm sounds like, but we're going to do it anyway, you know, and he's smiling. He's having a good time. and. And unfortunately, that's where we're at right now, you know, uh, trying to spend so much money, you know, and I, also, oh. and, I, and I gave the analogy too that even, and I think I got the little slide right here too, is the universe is so huge that a hundred million dollars is really not a whole lot. And when you look at how many, how many stars are in the universe, you're really only looking at you know, if you compare many, there are more stars in the universe than all the sand on planet Earth, and basically, a hundred million dollars only supports maybe half a bucket of sand. So, and that sand is still a, a bucket of worms that the dog's listening to. So, who knows what's out there? Well, uh, Antonio, as you know, I'm a huge supporter of study, and and I think there's a there's a very large and extremely sophisticated literature on the topic. Uh, yeah. Some of the, some of the smartest people in the world are thinking about it. Uh, don't write them off. Uh, no, I, I'm not writing them off. That someone has to do it, but you know, someone has to do it, and you know, but that's just my personal opinion. There's, there's got to be a better way. We, you know, we assume they're using radio. They assume you're using light or whatever. We don't know that. All speculation, and that's is UFOs are the same way. Well, you know, you know we're, we're looking for something that's. And Marsha, Marsha emphasizes this. We're, we're we're still old school. We're looking for that mechanical flying saucer that's going to come in through the atmosphere. We don't know that. They can be coming in through different dimensions, or God knows they could be humans from the future. Well, we true. don't know that. We can speculate all day, have fun with this. That's true. We um, don't know that. But I tell you guys, you know, you talk about that that dog who's wearing headphones and his his uh copy his dictate is to go find worms in China and listen for them. Okay, the, it's even worse than that <laughs> in my mind. It is like we we are ants we are ants running around in our little colony and we have an extraordinarily elegant colony and we really know what's going on in our colony but ask one of them ants or a consortium of ants to try to tell them what that thing is that just rolled over the anthill which is a tractor or a car they do not have the capacity to ever figure that out and i would submit i fear the human being as we are now, unless, you know, some change happens to us, we do not have the capacity to figure out this phenomenon. I don't think we're capable of it. We don't know. We, we, uh, if, if they exist, they're, they're moving away from us every day because the universe is expanding, and unless they're emigrated somewhere else. So even if they can beam a signal towards us it's, it's at the speed of light, it might take a little longer because that signal is technically moving away from us as the universe expands and accelerates. Well, ex um, so, expansion is lo locally. The expansion is not very significant. Yeah, well, not locally, but we haven't detected anything locally, at least within but the, a few light years. Here's the fascinating thing about our species, and uh, we are we are captive to this. We are always going to wonder why, and we're always going to search. That's just who we are. And even though we, it might be a, you know a little grain of sand in a bucket we're still we're gonna we're gonna try to figure things out around us and god bless us that's what we're gonna do and it may not be something we can ever get a handle on but it's not going to be for lack of trying huh right This brings us to the end of API Case Files, Episode 8. I've been your host, Marsha Barnhart, and you heard also from Professor Antonio Paris and Paul Carr.
This podcast is a production of Aerial Phenomenon Investigations. Links in the show notes for this episode can be found at apicasefiles.com. The spoken content of API Case Files is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 license. All music heard on this podcast is licensed under Creative Commons. This free use with attribution music is deeply appreciated, and we thank the musicians and songwriters for sharing their creative spirit. Featured during this episode was the group Broke for Free. Our podcast theme is by Totality Music and DJ Spooky. If you want to drop us a line, that would be great. We can read your letters on the show. We always appreciate your input and ideas on content. Email director at aerial-phenomenon.org. Episode 9 of API Case Files should be out in the late winter of 2015 with more case discussions, interviews, and hopefully some interesting input from you, our listeners. Meanwhile, thanks for joining us, and we hope you recommend API Case Files and API Conversations to your friends and acquaintances. Files.